Hey everyone and welcome back to the Let's Build series, the series where I show off my work process on 3D projects from start to finish. And it recently came to my attention that I hadn't done anything for 256 Fest. And for anyone who doesn't know what 256 Fest is, by this point it's practically an annual low poly festival that started last year on Twitter. And it has now come back around again. And as someone who practically lives and breathes this stuff, I can't not participate. So I thought for a good while what would make a good thing to model for this year's 256 Fest, and it came to me when I realized I hadn't played Earthbound in about a year or more. So to make up for this, I wanted to model a creature from the game and decided to do a rendition of the Spiteful Crow because it's iconic and cool looking. So for those of you who don't know anything about 256 Fez, there's more to it than just making a low poly model. There are two criteria that a model must reach. Number one, the final model must not exceed 256 tries, not faces. All tries are faces, but not vice versa, and all faces are made up of tries regardless of how many edges they have. So no cheating. So to make sure that I don't go over this limit, I've turned on scene statistics down here so I have a constant counter of how many tries I've used and to know my budget. And the second criterion is that all models must use 256 by 256 resolution textures, which isn't really that big of a deal because that's what I use anyway. So jumping straight in, to begin making the model, I always start with the head. So I added a cube and split it down the middle with a loop cut and then took the left and right edges to scale them down to create a round profile. I then added another loop cut along the width of the cube and began constructing the beak. So I pulled the centermost vertex out and subdivided the edges that came with it to create a rounder profile for the beak and then I started the shape of the head around it. I accidentally stumbled on this shape when I was adjusting the brow of the head and it made the eyes pop out in a way that I really liked so I cemented the shape by bridging the vertices of the brow to the cheek and forcing a try in this area. Then I had to do it again because it caused the beak to completely collapse. You may have noticed that I haven't added a mirror modifier to this model and I have a good reason for that. Once I shaped up the head to the point that I liked I wanted to open up the beak so I can get in there and give it a mouth. I did a vertex rip and then just joined the adjacent edges together to form tries on the inside of the mouth. If I was using a mirror modifier the mouth would have to be split down the middle, which would double the tries that I would need from 2 to 4. I'm trying to be as frugal as possible, and it's really easy to hit the 256 mark without trying. Once I got the mouth in place, I turned on automatic smoothing to add sharps to the edges of the beak, and then I gave the crow its cool shades. I also gave it the little feather that sticks out of the top of its head, and from here I went on to make its body by duplicating the bottom part of the head and extruding it down to put it into shape. I used a cube to make the feet and scaled them on the normals to shape it, and since the feet wouldn't be connected together, I decided I'd use the mirror modifier. I also went on to add the tail feathers to the back of the body. Honestly, instead of extruding them out of the back like I did, I probably should have just added another cube, scaled it flat, and extruded it to save more tries, but that's retro vision for you. Did a little bit of proportional editing to tune out the body some more and gave him his little bow tie, just two little tries across the chest. I then went on to finish the feet. I would wanted to give him some ankles, so I moved his feet down and subdivided the top face to extrude it up to make them. Then I got a bit too big for my britches by trying to make three individual toes by subdividing the front face of the foot and trying to inset them to extrude them out. This got me dangerously close to the 256 limit before I'd even gotten to the wings or any other details, so I quickly scrapped the idea. So what I did instead was edit three triangular talents at the end of the foot by aligning the face in orthographic view, adding a circle with a vertex count set to three, and then extruding this triangle to a point and duplicating it twice along the foot. For the wings, I duplicated a side from the torso, separated it from the mesh, and gave it a mirror modifier before extruding it down and solidifying it into a full wing. I also had full intentions of animating this wing, so I gave it a bevel at the elbow so it could bend properly when the time came. The model was basically done at this point, and I had 42 tries left in the budget, so I figured why not add another subdivision to the edges of the beak? It would add more detail to the mouth when I animated it. I then scaled the crow down to a more reasonable size, and for some reason decided to just go ahead and delete the right side of the crow to give it a mirror modifier anyway. Literally, no reason why I did this, it did more harm than good. Speaking of things that are harmful, I decided I wanted to be extra and give this crow a cigar. The reason being is I had thought in the original Japanese version of Earthbound, the crows actually had cigarettes and they were removed when they got localized in America. And that was partially correct, it wasn't Earthbound that had the smoking crows, but the original Mother One. So I decided to do that as a sort of homage to that and to give it a little bit more visual interest. And to be extra harmful, I decided to make the tips of the cigars rounded instead of flat, which it had triple the amount of tries than it needed to. With the model finished, it was time to move on to UV mapping, texture painting, and rigging in no particular order. I started setting up the material for the model first to get them ready for vertex printing, and then decided to jump straight into rigging to get them out of the way. Now, I was absolutely not going to give this thing a robust rig, that would just be silly. I was just going to give it a serviceable deform rig and just bear the pure FK animation process. But to quickly run you through my skeletal hierarchy, I had a root bone, a center of gravity bone, chest bone, head, and jaw, and two bones for every outer extremity. Just a very rudimentary rig. I also edited the feet midway through this, I had just collapsed the top edge of the foot here just to save some tries. Once I got all the bones 
Knights named in some tries over, I started reweighting the models to fix the flesh nightmare that it became when the automatic systems failed. Considering it was low poly and largely segmented mesh, it was really easy to resolve. Unfortunately, the hurt from the mirror modifier revealed itself when I went to weight the mouth. The lips became fused together again, which I had to re-rip, and I had to apply the mirror modifier to refill the faces the way they had originally been. I then went on finishing out the rigging process to get everything deforming as best as it could. With rigging done, I moved on to blocking out the colors of the crow, painting them with vertex colors to get a general idea of how it would look. I then went on to UV map everything so I could bake this down into a map. This took about 20 minutes to do, mapping each thing piece by piece and stacking the mirror sides of the body on top of each other to save as much space as possible on the texture. Now, this only took 20 minutes, largely because I got indecisive halfway through. I had finished stacking up all the UV maps, and I was left with a lot of extra space that I wanted to fill in somehow. I worked on it for a little bit before throwing it out and just sticking with what I had with some minor adjustments. When I went to check the taxel density to see where I stood with the UV space, I realized it was fine. After I changed the color of the beak and feet to yellow, as they should be, I started experimenting with the idea of using wiggle bones for the feathers and cigar, so I wouldn't have to animate them. So sometimes, moving forward, you might see them flopping around, and that would be the reason why. I didn't end up using wiggle bones, but just so you know, that's what's happening. With the vertex colors in place, I baked them out into a base texture map. That is, of course, after a few failed tries from not selecting everything when I hit bake. And I was about to start painting when a rogue neuron fired to remind me I was supposed to be doing something to the wings. I wanted to fix how the elbows collapsed when the wings bent inward too much, and to fix that, I was going to use corrective shape keys. So with the wings bent as they are, I made the basis shape key and added the new shape key that would be the corrective one. I made sure I had this new shape key selected, and from here started to adjust this wing to make it look better when bent. Then to get this for the other wing, I simply deleted it, copied the wing object, mirrored it over to the other side, reweighted it, and flipped the normals. Now now, was there an easier way to do this? Yes, there was. I'm just fucking stupid. All I needed to do was duplicate the shape keys and then click mirror shape key. Classic. After repressing the memory of my own ineptitude, it was time to move on to actually make the driver. Now, the way the shape key would work would be dependent upon the x-axis of the second wing's bone. I converted it to Euler rotation and copied the x-axis as a driver to paste into the key value. The problem is that the driver doesn't use the degree value, it uses the radian value. So to fix it, I had to convert the driver to a scripted expression and multiply the Euler rotational value by the conversion formula which is 180 divided by pi. Now that's not what I wrote, I wrote 360 divided by 2 pi which is the formula that I've always used. I'd never thought about this fact before because my formula had always worked, so I never thought about trying to simplify it further until I checked Wikipedia while writing this. After the Euler value is converted to degrees, all I had to do was divide the value by negative 90 to get a normalized value between 0 and 1. So now when the arm is fully extended, the shape key would be 0, and as it bent inward, the shape key would slowly gain influence until it hit negative 90 degrees, as shown here. And now it's finally time for some texture painting, and I got some pretty good feedback from last time about how you guys wanted to see more detail about the texture painting process and how I was doing it. So I'll try to be a little bit more insightful than last time. Starting with the sunglasses, I wanted to make them cool and stylistic by giving them these sort of line reflections. And because of the way that I overlap them in the UV space, I only needed to paint one of them. And then with a brush set to addition blending, I went over the top of them to add some highlights, and then used the multiply brush to darken them near the bottom. That's basically how I texture paint everything, using the same color of the blocked out areas, I either use addition to add highlights or multiply to add shade. Highlights on top, shade on the bottom. Of course, sometimes I'll add details here and there and that will require different color and different shades and highlights, and sometimes I'll use a texture brush and that's its own story. I'm not entirely sure how much more insightful I can be on the matter. You just have to understand the profile of the shapes you are shading and how they should be lit. I can show you how I use the brushes, but I can't show you how to hold them. You have to figure that out for yourself. After I painted the sunglasses, I moved on to the feather on top of his head to give it some shine and I added some ridges to make it look more like a feather. Then I moved on to the tie, and I came to realize pretty quickly that the tie was too simple. It wouldn't look right textured as it was, and I still had 23 tries left in the budget, so I gave it a subdivide and made it look more bow shaped, which made it look much better when it was fully painted. I thought about giving the crow nostril holes, but decided against it when I couldn't find any good references to show this, so I just shaded it like normal. I then started texturing the inside of the mouth, laying down a multiply gradient with the fill tool to darken the mouth to give the illusion of depth. 
I then started drawing the tongue out in pink and added some shading to make it look more 3D, and then for good measure threw one more multiply gradient down to darken the tongue and the mouth some more. As I got closer to working on the feathers, I was afraid that my workflow up to now had been better suited if I was using multiple layers instead of just being all in one. So I added a new ambient occlusion layer and mixed it with the original by multiply to get the same shading effect. And from here, I began working on the body which I needed to paint feathers onto. Now my problem through this process is I couldn't get the damn feather brush to look right. I was using an image to act as a brush texture so I could just paint the feathers on and be along my way, but this took me well over 20 minutes to get the settings that I liked. I tried three different textures, multiple different ways of painting them, including view plane, stencil, and tiling, and it was a pain in the ass. Also, if the colors of the feathers are a tad bit dark for you guys to see, it's probably because I had recently calibrated my color display on my monitor to try to get a better display. At the time I was painting this, I had my gamma turned up pretty high, so everything looked brighter than it actually was. Once I was done working on the body, I moved to work on the cigar, and after painting on the burning ends, I had realized that adding the little decorative paper that tend to wrap these things would not be in the car cards with the UVs as they currently are. They would just end up distorted, so I went into the UV editor and took the faces and squared them out. I did this with an add-on called Magic UV, which I think comes natively with Blender. Once I was done, I popped the texture over into GIMP and added the cigar paper there. And there I went on to finish up the feet where I added some shine on the talons, added some ridges for the toes, and shaded the underside of the foot. And with that, the texture painting was done. I baked the two layers together and plugged the new texture in, and then moved on to make the animation. Now, the animation was just going to be a simple loop, only one to two seconds long. So I figured I would do some kind of marching animation. And since I was still thinking about using wiggle bones, I started the animation 24 frames in so they could settle. Of course, this didn't really help anything, but I digress. So the first thing that I needed were my keyframes, and I was going to need five of them to make the march. Frame one would be left foot up, and then both feet on the ground, then right foot up, both feet on the ground, and then back to left foot, and it would loop from there. To get the second foot up pose, I basically copied the first keyframe twice, and in each one, using X symmetry and pose mode, paired up each foot with the other one's pose, and then deleted the keyframes for the original, then merged them together. Now, this is another one of my classic big brain moments where I was at the time too lazy to look for an easier solution, and since I also make these videos for myself, next time, instead of doing that, what I should do is paste the keyframes in by hitting Control shift v to get the flipped version of the copy frames. Once I had made the motion for the torso and the legs, it was time to move on to the wings, which I didn't really know exactly what to do with them. I wasn't sure if I was going to make them swing forward like someone is marching, but I had settled on the idea of having them flap, and then got to work making him do just that. So every time a foot would step, the wings would flap once, so the arms would loop twice while the legs would loop once during this animation. I also set up the wings to have some follow through, so that when the upper part of the arm starts to move back, the lower part would bend to keep its inertia before changing direction to head back the other way. Now, I may be speeding through this a bit, and that's because animation is abstract and difficult to fully describe my entire thought process. It also probably doesn't help that this is supposed to be a bite-sized video, and trying to explain how I animate in less than five minutes is just not possible. So, uh, sorry. So after I get my keyframes in place, I jump into the graph editor to try to set up the in-betweens to make it look more natural, and to also try to obfuscate the looping as best as possible. With the lower arm, the motion must carry through the loop as it swings, so the keyframes at the beginning and end must be rotated to keep this sine wave smooth. Unfortunately, this kind of editing doesn't seem to mirror from one arm to the other, so I had to transfer it manually by copying the keyframes from one to the other. And you can do this by copying the keyframes and hitting Control shift v to paste them in flipped, instead of doing what I did, which was paste them in regularly, and then go into the graph editor to mirror the Y and Z lines across the zero value. Once that was done, I went on to animate the cigar and hair, keeping the ideas of follow through in mind, and with that, I was done with the animation. So I pushed the March animation to the NLA editor and made it loop a good few times. At one point, I had realized that the shape keys of the arms were broken and had to put the drivers back in. And while I was working on the shape keys, I figured I'd also give this crow a sinister smile shape key because these feathery bastards like to steal my bread rolls. I had made the shape key back before I started this animation, sometime while I was texture painting, but now I was actually going to put them to use to make the animation more dynamic. Dynamic. So I made a shape key animation in the shape key editor and pushed that to the NLA as well. And then I made a new pose action to sort of lower the head when it smiled to give that sort of Jim Carrey effect. Then to undo the smile animation once it was done, I copied the animation strips and moved them down the timeline, and then reversed them so that way it would go back to where they were before. I think I had a few hiccups where this broke for some reason. Can't remember why, so it must have been something dumb that I did. 
And now we're on to the final step of this, and that is rendering. Now, I was inclined to just skip this part and just say a job well done, but I think it might be interesting to show some of the technical aspects of what I did, because I think it's important to know how I did some of the things I did for this render. So moving forward, I wanted to capture the sort of psychedelic nature of a fight in Earthbound, so I loaded a kaleidoscope HDR that I made some while ago and gave the crow a drop shadow to make it stand out. I added a camera and an empty to set up the turntable camera, parented the camera to the empty, and then gave the empty an oscillation animation from left to right. Now to render this, I wasn't just going to use the camera and just hit go. I was going to assemble the render in a new scene using the sequencer. In my default startup file for Blender, I always have a scene labeled sequencer specifically for things like this. So in the sequencer, I loaded the battle scene in as a strip and set the end frame to the correct number. And from here, I wanted to display some overlay stuff. Namely a wireframe display on a turntable, the texture I was using, and some stats about the model. To make the wireframe display, I made a new scene from the battle scene and posed the bird on a T-pose. I duplicated the model and gave the copy a wireframe modifier and a mission shader to show off the wireframes of the model. And after setting up the new turntable camera, I went into the render settings to set the background to be transparent and to render it out as a PNG sequence. So that way when I rendered it out as a viewport animation, I would be left with a transparent animation that I could use in the render. I loaded that in as well as the texture and I re realized that I needed a boundary to separate it from the left because of the clown vomit of colors on the screen. So I made a border area with polka dots for the overlay to sit in and started filling it with text that I also made it in GIMP. I also made a vignette overlay to sort of shade the inside window of the animation to make it look better. I added a watermark and changed the overlay padding to be red because I found it to be more striking. Now mind you, this entire time while I was making these decisions, I would think I was done, hit render animation, notice something I'd forget, stop it, fix it, and repeat. And I had done this probably 10 to 15 times times. I'm sparing you from myself. But yeah, that was my process for how I made this spiteful little crow guy. Hope that was helpful. Be sure to like and subscribe or leave a comment telling me that you like this video. It's one of the only ways that I know that it's worth continuing. If you want to support what I do, you can support me on Ko-Fi or check out any of my other important links down below. But other than that, yeah, that's all I have to say. So see ya.